welcome out there to the Switch for Good podcast. I am Dotsie Bausch, and I am here with my co-host, Alexandra Paul. Hi, Dotsie. Hello there. So, goodness gracious, how many times do we get asked about how much protein do you need? Or <laughs> yeah. do I need? Or does my dog need? <laughs> or my bird? Or It's constant, right? Yeah. It's constant. How much protein do I need? So, uh, we have some protein factoids today that we're going to go over. Um, I think first and foremost, one of the most important things to start out with, and I was very specific about this um, when I gave my TED Talk, actually, because the first question that I think needs to be asked is, in, a, in this over-protein society that we live in, is how much protein does someone really need? I mean, let's just kind of get down to it, right? Look, look at the science and look at the amount. Well, the recommended daily amount is about 0.8 grams of protein per kilo of body weight. So that's only about 0.4 grams per pound. So you would take your weight and you'd multiply by 0.4 mm -hmm. in, in pounds. Yeah. Okay. Right, right. right. So that is, uh, so, so let's just say for, I, I am, I don't weigh myself ever. I'm uh, assuming I'm somewhere around 135, right? So, so that's like 50 grams. The day for me. And when I was at my most extreme training, I mean, training for the Olympics, trying to put on a ton of glute and hamstring muscle, I mean, really, really, really working hard, I was at about 1.3 per kilogram of body weight, which at the time I weighed a little bit more. So that was about 90 grams. And that, I mean, that kind of felt like a lot, quite frankly, uh, not so great for my kidneys as we were speaking about earlier. Um, but I was trying to really put on a ton of muscle mass as I was moving over from a, in a, in a road racer to a track racer. Um, so, but nowadays, I, well, nowadays I don't even think about it. I don't even count. I don't even worry about it. It's like, I know that if I'm getting enough calories, <gasps> magically I'm getting enough protein. Because you eat a whole food plant-based diet. So from, uh, from, if you eat a enough calories and you're eating whole foods and not processed foods, you will get the nutrients you need, including protein. In fact, and this I think is so interesting. If you eat, for example, I eat about 2000 calories a day. If I just ate that in broccoli, I would be getting 146 grams of protein. Just that's, to, And that's way too much. That's and way it, too much. <laughs> but it just shows you how much protein are in green vegetables. I mean, it, it sounds almost ridiculous. Exactly. Of course, no one's going to do exactly. that. But um, And in potatoes, like if you know how much I like potatoes. You're and a potato so, lady. <laughs> if I just ate potatoes all day, I would get 42 grams of protein uh, from those potatoes. And actually, that's about what I like to get between 40 and 50, I think is what I calculated was good for me. Yeah. I feel yeah. great on that. Yeah. What we like to... Um, focus on really more than the macronutrients, right, which are carbohydrate, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, are the micronutrients, right? So the vitamins and the minerals and the antioxidants, right? The real workhorses of, of what make us feel alive and vibrant and are good for Fiber. our cellular regeneration. I, it just and, really yep. irks me. Everyone's into protein and are you getting enough protein? And, and most Americans are not getting enough fiber. And that's, yeah. and there's really no, you don't really hear about protein deficiency among Americans unless they're not eating enough calories if they're starving themselves. So we really, no people, I hope that we, we helped, you know, slay that myth that it's so hard to get lots of protein and you have enough protein and you have to work really hard at. No, you just have right, to eat like a whole it's a job or diet. something. Yeah. So here we promise some factoids. So yes. we're just going to go through like, Four or five foods that are just delicious, amazing, filled with those micronutrients, but also enough protein. So lentils, 18 grams of protein per cup. Edamame, 17 grams per cup. Tofu, 8 grams per cup. Peanut butter. Mm, I which, like peanut butter. And you like potatoes. I like peanut butter on my potatoes. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. Um, seven grams uh, for two ta for only two tablespoons of peanut butter. Mm. And then the potatoes, like you mentioned, um, there's four grams of protein in just a medium to small white potato. So, wow. Yeah. So, people, you don't need to worry about protein. Don't let that hold you back from eating a plant-based diet. You do not need the meat and the milk. To get, to get yourself protein, you can just eat whole foods, healthy whole plant foods. From the earth. Yeah. So let's actually, this is a perfect uh, way to segue into our guest who also doesn't count her macros or her micros. And 
I'm pretty sure doesn't weigh, encourage her clients to weigh themselves and things. We're talking today with Jenna Hollenstein. She's a registered dietitian who helps people struggling with chronic dieting, disordered eating, and eating disorders, but she has a non-diet approach. She uses intuitive eating, mindfulness techniques, and meditation to help her clients move towards greater peace and wellness. Jenna has a private practice, and she's located in New York City, but you can also talk, uh, consult with her in person or virtually. Uh, she's written three books, including Drinking to Distraction, which I definitely want to talk about. I am dying to die into yeah. that one. And her most recent book is called Eat to Love, and it's about finding fullness within instead of through food. So welcome, Jenna, to the Switch for Good podcast. Thank you. So I wanted to start off with... <clears throat> One of my closest friends is a dentist, and she was inspired to become a dentist because she had terrible teeth when she was younger. And uh, that was my friend, Roya, who is my dentist. <laughs> <laughs> and your teeth are beautiful. <laughs> and um, my friend, Jen Kramer, she's an esthetician because she struggled with acne when she was a kid. Now she specializes mm -hmm. in folks with acne. It does amazing, amazing things helping them with their skin. And I'm wondering, Jenna, did your work as a dietitian and helping people to overcome their, their uh, uh, unhealthy relationship with food. Did that stem from something in your past? Definitely. I mean, I don't know any female in my life who does not struggle or has not struggled at some point with her relationship with food and mm -hmm. body. And I came up in a home where dieting and good and bad foods was the norm. So um, it didn't seem exceptional to me and in any way to develop a, an interest in these things. In food, but specifically in sort of like how to eat the right way, I always think it's interesting that the, the URL for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which used to be the American Dietetic Association, is eatright.org. And the idea that there's a way to eat right, oh. that was sort of assumed. It's common sense. It's funny, eat right, because I actually have <laughs> always in my, my whole life, well, no, not my whole life, but from being a teenager onwards, assigned good and bad foods. And if I eat bad foods, then I've also felt like a bad person. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of people feel that kind of guilt, like they're somehow morally wrong if they don't eat, quote, right. It's so true. There is such an interesting parallel between food and eating and morality that I, I think is very complex. Um, and there are people who have really, you know, gone into this in great detail. Um, there's a great book, I think it's called The Religion of Thin. Um, but I mean, even if you just look at some of the rules and language that we use around food and eating, it smacks of morality. Like, I mean, if you, it's like, um, I've been good today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, if, if we did not live in a diet culture, we might mean, we might think that that means like, I didn't steal anything. I didn't hit anybody, you know, <laughs> I have a toddler, so we're, we're dealing with these basic lessons. And, you know, in the diet culture, it's understood that I've been good today means I've eaten in a restrained way, or I've, I've refrained from indulgent foods or foods that would fit in that category of bad foods. Where does that come from, or where does that stem from, the idea that if we are eating certain foods that, that we are in an inherently goodness is coming from us? Well, yeah. Where does that even lead back to from, I don't even know, the beginning of time or what? How well, did gluttony, that... you know, like the Bible and maybe other religious point. texts says gluttony a is a sin. Mm -hmm. And then we're certainly in America, we come from puritanical roots. There are people here who were here before the, the Puritans came here. But this culture that we have now was basically um, came from the Puritans. Yeah. I do think that there are specifically religious underpinnings to some of these things. Um, you know, this, this seeking purity, seeking to, to rid ourselves of, of unpure or impure things, thoughts, deeds, whatever. Fasting is a big thing among religious yeah. gurus, mm -hmm. right? 
and, and refraining from specific foods that are considered to be less than, less pure, less clean. Mm-hmm. Those are all very normal parts of some um, spiritual or religious practices. But I also think it has to do, I mean, let's just go for it, right? I mean, I think it has to do with um, women's bodies and control of women's bodies. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the book Appetites by Caroline Knapp, but she goes mm-hmm. into this about this kind of, this repression of our desires, this repression of our, our needs and our wants for things and how they, they go underground and then they reemerge as something different. And so, you know, I often find people acting out their desire for intimacy with food, for example. Are you, when you say intimacy for sex or to connection? Um, it could be sex or connection or it could be sensuality it could just be physical touch doesn't have to be um sexual in nature but a lot of things that come from the denial of the human body can then manifest in a sort of distortion of the relationship with food i definitely when i was hitting puberty you know people said i was too loud i was too much and i Uh. equated having eating too much with being unfeminine yes too many appetites wanting sexuality too is unfeminine. Big desires, Mm -hmm. like able to have it all. Jenna, what would, what was the, like the impetus or the beginning of your, um, demons in terms, in terms of food or body image? Do you remember when you were struggling, what what were some of the first things that you remember coming into your mind of, of, uh, and what you were judging yourself? Uh, what measuring stick were you judging yourself by and how old were you? I mean, I definitely identify with that too muchness. And at the same time, the sort of like not enoughness. Oh, it's, yeah, it's that's true. very tricky for women to hit that, that right yeah. sweet spot in the middle because we're constantly being monitored and judged and um, compared. So I think that it began for me as my own struggle to to figure out how to live and how to have a, a happy, satisfying, peaceful life and bumping up against the things that we all do in different ways based on where I came from and all the different kind of demographics that I, you know, was exposed to. Restraining myself, um, restricting food or eating, for example, in secret. Or I, I describe for, um, in one part of the book how I used to come home from school before I'd have to go back for basketball practice. And I would eat basically a fourth full meal sitting in front of the TV in the kitchen, watching Oprah Winfrey with a big bowl of pasta with butter and cheese. And that was my like me time Mm -hmm. before going back to this like freezing cold gym that I, you know, didn't necessarily want to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know who I was. I mean, like a lot of kids, you know, I was kind of trying to figure that out. And, you know, I always felt like a little bit of a weirdo, Um, you know, even just being taller than other kids felt like a way in which I was different. And so trying to find that balance of fitting in and yet also being unique and just not having any kind of roadmap because none of us do. I was also a very sensitive kid, and so I kind of picked up on a lot of things in the environment, in my family, in school, and things like that. And so I just found that my anxiety and um, my my own internal struggles expressed themselves in this way that I didn't realize at the time a lot of people's anxieties expressed themselves, because this is how we're shaped by the culture. I mean, I, I joke with my clients about, you know, their thoughts about dieting, you know, I'm sure that they have lots of original ideas, but this was not one of them. You know, this is something that we don't even realize we're taking in and absorbing from the time that we're really, really young. When you say this, you mean the, the fact that we need to diet? The idea that being in a smaller body or the, the idea that not having needs or an appetite or desires is desirable, mm. more desirable than being in a larger body or in having mm. like over the top kind of appetites and desires and and sort of, you know, sensual needs. I always think that it's cr- the, the, where people get into trouble, it's great to have 
desires and needs. But when we are in a culture where there are addictive foods, that's where the problems arise, don't you think? Because in other countries, people seem to relish food more, and they don't. They seem to have a healthier. Um, even if they repress women, actually, they seem to have a healthier relationship with food. Mm -hmm. And it seems like maybe it's because the the foods that they're dealing with are not as addictive. Do well, I, I actually don't subscribe to the addiction model of oh. food. I, I mean, from the research that I've read, the it's, it's not clear to me that there are foods that are addictive. I also think what's interesting and what's different between, for example, the U.S. and other countries is that they don't think of foods as addictive. I mean, the the biggest glaring problem that I see in the research that seems to posit the idea of food addiction is that they don't control for the effects of restriction. Because when you take away something or suggest that you should not be having something, it changes something. You know, and I experienced right, this firsthand when I was pregnant, you know, and, and I was told not to eat certain foods um, that, Interestingly, are pregnant women are not told to avoid in other countries, for example. Mm. And so I found myself wanting the things that I couldn't have. I remember spending this weekend with my, my friend. He, it was a big birthday weekend or something like that. I, was, I just found out that I was pregnant. Nobody else knew. And I remember wanting deli meat. <laughs> and it's funny because like I had just learned or just remembered because I had learned this I'm sure in school that you know there's an increased risk of foodborne illness specifically from listeria from things that are potentially not temperature controlled properly like deli meat or something like that or like things with mayonnaise or whatever so but I remember this like internal struggle that I had sitting at a table at breakfast one morning and like wanting like a slice of turkey or something like that when honestly it wouldn't bother me it wouldn't even dawn on me in another situation knowing that I wasn't supposed to have it made me want it right that goes I, right back to the beginning of what we were talking about with re repression and the puritanist society right the second you're told you can't that's what you want yeah yeah and it distorts something that's natural so mm. is this where intuitive I've heard the term intuitive eating comes in um, can you explain what, what that is? That's a technique that you use with your clients, right? Yeah. Intuitive eating is a model of eating that was developed by two dietitians. Um, they're both located in Beverly Hills, I think, um, Evelyn Triboli and Elise Resch. The first edition of their book came out in 1995, and it consists of 10 principles, but it can basically be distilled down to three basic things, which is what they've used to study it in the research. And the first thing is that people eat primarily for physical rather than emotional reasons. They give themselves unconditional permission to eat. So there's no good and bad foods. There's no moral superiority or inferiority. Um, or like I say, the carrot and the carrot cake are on an equal moral plane. They're just different combinations of protein, carb, and fat. And then the third criterion is that they have ways of coping with emotions that don't involve food. And so, and the fourth edition of this book is coming out soon. I, I, I just heard from Evelyn that it's um, in the works. And there have been more than 100 studies that have come out examining the influence of intuitive eating practices on outcomes, both physical and mental. And that, that body of research is only continuing to increase and to debunk the idea that we need to exert control over our bodies in order to manage them and to be healthy. Yeah. What, Go ahead. So how do you help somebody? Because for, so, for me, if I came to see you and you had said to me 20 years ago that I should not have any rules about food and I could eat sugar because I'll have to re-look at my uh, framing of this, but I feel like I'm an ad addicted to sugar. But sugar was also very restricted in my household and when I was growing up, so it became this taboo food that I, yeah. I either restricted completely as an adult or overate. Um, so form response to restriction, by the way. Yeah. So I, you have a, you have a, 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 a toddler now. So I want to ask you about how you are raising him. Um, but I, so I have a lot of questions, so yeah. we, let's get to that, but let's first go to, 
if I came to you and you said, Alexandra, just go intuitively with what you feel you should eat. I would have just eaten sugar, 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 because that's all I wanted. And in fact, I can get myself into that pretty easily is just eating sugar because other foods just don't particularly interest me that much. Yeah. So how would, how would you, how would you help a client like I? I, I would never do that because I think that's like taking someone who not only has never learned to swim, but has been told that they can swim and throwing them into the water. And I don't think that's fair. So how would you, oh, okay. So you wouldn't deal, I, you wouldn't, um, I, I wouldn't start with intuitive you, eating. Yeah, well, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't just throw you out there without supports. Okay. I mean, I would start by giving you some background on the, on the research, what the research shows about, for example, the effects of restriction, the effects of intentional efforts on weight loss, which lead to long-term weight gain. So intentional efforts on weight, that means you, dieting? Dieting oh, to exercise. lose weight or to control your weight leads to long-term weight gain. Mm -hmm. um, I would also help you by reflecting back to you in your own experience what has happened when you've encountered these different situations. So, for example, probably in the first conversation that we would have, we would get into the fact that sugar was restricted at home for you. And so you received this message when you were at a very tender young age that this was dangerous, your body could not be trusted to self-regulate, and so if you did not exert that kind of control, something bad would happen. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of, that just normally contributes to pendulum swinging behavior. You, you know, binge and then you restrict, and then the, the restriction feeds the binge, and then the binge drives your desire to restrict again. And you never discover that middle ground. And, and it should be said that um, the act of eating and the act of eating sugar in particular is pleasurable for most of us, right? We come out of the womb liking sweet things. That's what gets us to drink breast milk or formula. It's a survival mechanism that's built into us, you know? We develop a taste for other things, but we're born liking sweet things. So to take that natural, you know, proclivity and make it a problem contributes to these distortions I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm not telling you what the situation is in your body. I mean, that would be against the principles of intuitive eating, right? Each person has to decide for themselves what feels good. What I do is help you connect with what's actually happening and to start to differentiate between things that are going on that are mental activities and what's actually happening kind of in your body. Because a lot of these thoughts about sugar addiction, these are mental activities and they're fed by the hysteria around it and by the sort of mythology that you were fed as a, as a child that it was dangerous and you shouldn't have it, right? And maybe that was passed down to you. It usually is. Jenna, I have a question <clears throat> on this since we're using um, Alexandra as our sample over here. Um, <laughs> just, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to my journey. Yeah, it just came to me because you and I have talked about this multiple times on the show. And so if sugar would indeed not be something that she would need to restrict. And so let's say tomorrow um, it was like, oh, OK, I can have sugar. So as you have explained to me, you would probably eat a lot of it. But then if you didn't wake up the next morning and say, bad, 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 and no more sugar, no more sugar, which you've explained to me that, you know, and then you eat, you know, whole foods and, and, and not processed sugar, you eat plenty of fruits, but nothing mm -hmm. proce yeah. processed. Um, it sounds like what you're saying is that then is what starts that whole process of restriction, binging, restriction, binging. So if you just kept eating sugar, would you kind of kind of get tired of it or would it almost would you be able to have a breakthrough uh because it wasn't bad anymore and then you're just kind of like all right well enough already Pro i i always ask people who work in ice cream shops or now in vegan ice cream shops but you know like w w do you like are you able to res you know what's your favorite ice cream and w and do you overeat and they go they always say well in the beginning i did but now eh uh, you know, so uh, I think yeah. that that pro also because if you did eat a lot, if I do eat a lot of sugar, I don't feel that good. 
So then you start craving something else. Yes. And that would be part of the intuitive eating, right? I mean, there are, there are physical things that would happen and there are psychological things that would happen. Physiologically, there's this thing called sensory specific satiety. So when you're continually exposed to the same thing, you get less of a charge from it. You know, we experience this in the course of just eating a meal or a dessert or something like that, where the first couple of bites kind of set off fireworks and then subsequent bites kind of a little less so. And then gradually you get less kind of reward for continuing and to eat that same this. thing. But if someone else comes and says, oh, and here, that's why buffets people tend to overeat is because they have different, so many choices. So mm-hmm. their satiety isn't. They try and get satiated by all these different foods. and they're, they're But also their values are different. They might be trying to get the biggest bang for their buck and mm. not necessarily considering their internal signals. That's true. I mean, when you become an intuitive eater, you can overeat at a buffet or you can say, you know, I'm just going to eat what I feel I need. Yeah. I, I, can, I can vouch for the fact that as an intuitive eater, I... I have experiences where I do not overeat at a buffet unless it's a really good buffet and I choose to overeat, which I consider to be part of normal eating. Yeah. The, 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 the second um, rule that you mentioned where no foods are off limits, that was an enormous part of my healing process because I healed as well through um, – meditation therapy and intuitive eating. And so as I was coming out of um, the process of healing from my anorexia and was, you know, pretty much 100% better and was starting to navigate the the journey towards becoming a professional cyclist and um, got on the U.S. national team, there were a lot of nutritionists and dietitians in my life all of a sudden who were just, you know, well-meaning people. And I remember sitting down with them and giving kind of giving them my rules because this was my food and I was the one that was going to be taking it in and producing uh, efforts off of the what it fueled me with. And I sat them down and I said, um, there will be no weighing of my food. There will be no calorie counting. There will be no portion control. There will be zero restrictions am- around types or kinds or sources of foods that I am able to eat. There is nothing. Virtual fist bump. Yes. Boom. (laughs) (laughs) And it felt really empowering sitting down and saying that to, to people that were, that's pretty much, I think what they were just about to give me was all of the restrictive because I was. um, And you set some major boundaries based on mm -hmm. what you knew to be true from your experience, because these were all things that probably triggered or would potentially trigger you know, disordered behavior. Completely. Cause I had been, that's how I had been healing. And in a sport that is gravity challenged, uh, there was a lot of dieting going on around me, uh, in, in, with my teammates and they, the, the nutritionist, um, they obliged. I mean, they were like, all right, okay, here's what, here's what, here's what we go with. And, and it was, just the most peaceful, freeing feeling ever. I was pretty much one, the only one on the team that could eat whatever I want, whenever I wanted it in, in any certain amount I wanted it in. <laughs> and you had done the work. You yes. You had done the work because you no had doubt. to for your survival. Yeah, no and, doubt. And I think we all have to do the work. Um, but some of us are less pressed because we might never develop a severe eating disorder. And so that's why I put those words chronic dieting in there, which are words from the intuitive eating world, because a lot of us are in that gray area and we do not have a peaceful relationship with food in our bodies, but we also don't have an eating disorder according to the diagnosis criteria. Yeah, we, we, uh, Dotsie and I call that disordered eating instead of eating disorders, because pretty much, like you said, every woman you know struggles with food on some level. I think 90, over 90% of Americans struggle with food. Both men and women have disordered eating it sometimes or another. Yeah. Practices or thoughts or, act, you know, the way they act out it's in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think of those as distortions. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of what I try to do is to help reconnect people with the intuition and the instincts and the embodied wisdom that they have always had. But they feel they don't have wisdom. I know they don't feel because they have wisdom because willpower and 
a good diet are often linked. People think you have to have willpower to have a good diet. Can you address that? Oh, willpower. <laughs> it's revered in this country. It's just yeah. so interesting to me because, I mean, if you knew the accomplishments of the mostly women that I work with, there is no question that they have willpower. In all other areas of their life, right? Uh, well, in every area of their lives. And so that just tells me that willpower is not at the core of this issue. Mm -hmm. It's not about will. It's about conflicts with our human nature. Dieting conflicts with our basic drive to survive. Mm -hmm. And so what we see as eating disordered behaviors are our bodies trying to protect us. And that turnaround for me changes everything. The binge in response to the restriction is just the body trying to protect you. It's a completely rational, completely understandable response. And, you know, if you were, I mean, I think it's interesting that you put together the fact that um, giving yourself permission was the secret, right? Because as I started to say earlier, we have that physiologic sensory specific satiety and we have the psychological sort of tug of war. And if you give yourself unconditional permission, nobody's tugging on the other end of the rope. Mm -hmm. There's no one to fight against anymore. You can actually figure out what kind of sugar you like. If you even like sugar. <laughs> you know? Yeah, sometimes I'm, we're just reacting against because right. it's something to react against. Yeah, exactly. Our hand. exactly. If there's no one on the other side of the tug of war, there's no one to fight against. And you realize that you've just been fighting with yourself. Again, it wasn't your original thought. It's part of your programming. But it, in, in reality, it has been a fight with yourself all these years. You know what I'm saying? So I see that as sort of dropping all of that tension that has complicated and distorted things and allowing you to finally figure out what you like. And what tastes good and what feels good. Because it's not just about what it's like in your mouth. It's also about like what allows your body to feel good. Um, how, do you, how do you sort of play with it to um, tailor it to your life? To if you're going to be active one day or if you're just like lazing about by a pool. Or, you know, what do you need from moment to moment? I mean, that's where the mindfulness stuff comes in. That's where the the really being able to put the mind and the body in the same place at the same time comes into this to be able to pivot because we are changing moment to moment. Our needs are changing. And when we drop all this mental activity or at least put it in its place, because it's not useless, right? Um, we can start to have that intuition and that embodiment come out and drive the bus. I'd like to talk about mindfulness because that word uh, is, you hear about it a lot. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, and I know Dotsy, mindfulness really helped you when you were working with those blue dots. Um, and you can t talk with Jenna about that experience. But my, um, I, I'm a health coach also, and I have a client who, um, he says that he overcame his alcoholism through mindfulness and he's dealing with his sugar the same way. And I, I am been talking to him about how he's thinking the word mindfulness keeps you in your head and that a lot of times it's about your emotions too. And that's my, my one qualm with that word mindfulness. Yes. Can you talk, Dotsy, tell Jenna about how sure. you mindfulness helped you. And then Jenna, if you could talk about how you deal with your clients and teaching them to be mindful and what it really means. Yeah. Well, I just want to mention really quickly the idea that, I mean, the, the word mindfulness is not a proper translation. I've learned about this through my, my studies too. I think a more proper translation of the intention, the intended meaning would be heartfulness. Okay, good. That's a beautiful word. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really intuitive on your part for, for identifying the, the, the problems with this being sort of localized to the head. Mm -hmm. For me, I think it was, the word would be more just awareness in my kind of mind, body, and soul in, in the meditative type of practice that I did, um, which involved very much intuitive eating. Uh, the blue dots was, were, were um, when I first started out, they, I placed them around the house in trigger places for me. Mm 
um, uh, whether it was going to be uh, restricting or a binge and a purge. So whenever I saw one of these blue dots, I had to stop and sit and feel where in my body the pain was coming from. Because as many of us, not all of us, but um, my eating disorder stemmed from just inner pain. It's like some, you know, sex addiction does or alcohol addiction or drug addiction. And so I had to go to the place in my body where I was feeling the pain. I had to describe it, the shape of it, the size of it, the, um, what, if, if it was sharp or dull the texture. or the texture, perfect. Yes. Um, and so that was, is, yeah, called mindfulness, but you're right. It just, it was just placing that awareness, connecting my mind and my body and my soul, which were completely living separate lives <laughs> before uh, I started to, to go through this healing journey. I, and I think it's so interesting that the healing comes from re-including the body because so much of the disease and the problem comes from segregating the body and from vilifying the body and not trusting the body. Mm-hmm. And then we come back to ourselves through connecting with the body. And, you know, my area of of study and practice right now is the the sense of meditation with the body. It's not something that's happening up here. We wouldn't be able to practice if we didn't have a body. Right. You know? And so really coming back to that, and I think it's, it's just a really interesting point that you make that, every emotion has a physical manifestation. And in fact, perhaps that precedes the emotion. We don't know which comes first, you know. So, um, and, I, and I love the idea of uh, the blue dots, just like a sort of meditation bell mm-hmm. in a meditation hall that's used to remind you, like, come back, what's happening right now? So do you teach, do you actually use meditation with your clients to get them on a a daily practice or just when they are feeling gripped by uh, food obsession? It depends on the person and if they want to receive meditation instruction. I don't, I don't push it on anybody because I, it's a, it's a very sacred thing and I, and I wouldn't take it so lightly or treat it so disrespectfully as to kind of force it on people. Um, sometimes all that we do is explore mindfulness in different ways, even just a practice similar to what Dati was talking about, having something that brings you back to your intention, um, noticing what, or at whatever point it is that you notice, for example, you're acting out of an emotional hunger rather than a physical hunger. You know, you're eating out of a heart hunger, for example, as opposed to a physical hunger. Whenever it is that you notice, just taking three deep embodied breaths and feel the air coming in and dissolving out. To, to slow things down, to kind of interrupt the momentum of that autopilot and see where you are in space, which gives you options you don't have when you can't see where you are in space and you're just kind of reacting. Mm-hmm. Um, if and when people do request meditation instruction, I do give it and I do offer them resources for developing a home practice because I think that it is perfectly compatible with the intuitive eating approach um, for so many different reasons. It, it helps to slow things down It helps to connect the body and the mind um, and the heart, which always gets left out there. Um, It's, I think of it as the analogy for everything that we deal with, right? Because the only thing that's actually happening is right now, this moment, right? And, and yet, and, and our bodies are always in this present moment, but our minds are off in the past, out in the future, daydreaming, you know, doing all different things. And the practice of just bringing those two things back in line is essentially the underpinning of intuitive eating, the, is the underpinning of mindfulness practice, is the underpinning of me- meditation practice. 
Mm-hmm. When you have um, a client that, that, that comes to you and they probably have um, read your work and know that they're in for some intuitive eating, what are the first couple of things that you tell them to do when they are, leave your office and they're going to sit down to their first meal? What is, yeah. What does intuitive eating look like? What are some steps that our listeners can try? I mean, one of the first things that I almost always address is making sure that they're feeding their bodies regularly and adequately and satisfyingly, right? Mm -hmm. Satisfaction kind of is an ongoing process, but if we're not eating regularly, if we're going long periods of time without feeding ourselves, we're going to have erratic thoughts and behaviors about food. And so we can't address the emotional issues around food without first addressing the physical body, the human body that needs basic things to be okay. It needs sleep. It needs water. It needs food regularly. It needs fun and, and relaxation, right? It, right. It, there's a lot of things that we need that we sort of maybe don't always consider. Um, and a lot of these things influence our relationship with with food and body, you know, when we're not getting enough sleep, when we're not getting enough of a a break from work or from stress, when we're not managing stress, it would be completely normal to resort to food, which is generally thought of as a pleasurable activity. We, we have a, a, a preference for pleasure over pain. And so naturally we will gravitate toward sort of like the easiest source of those things. So it, does intermittent fasting make you as crazy as it makes me when people say, do you think I should intermittent? Some people ask me, I'm like, why? What? Yeah. <laughs> What's the deal? What, 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 what is, why? why? Why is it? I don't even know how it ever came up. I don't know. It just seems like another form of here's another way to diet. But um, I just think it's, it's, it's the same thing with a slightly different name. I mean, to me, it's like, so what if you can get research showing that it causes decreases in weight. I mean, the people that I work with, the stress, the emotional and physical stress of restriction is not worth Mm. any evidence-based outcome. That's a good point right there. Uh, You know, it's funny that you bring up uh, intermittent fasting because I'm afraid of restriction because I was anorexic then bulimic. And so I just just get so fearful that I will... I don't like restricting myself. So. Right. But I actually was kind of feeling a little guilty that I couldn't go 12 hours without eating. I, I actually felt like I was a bad person in a way um, because of intermittent fasting and that I it makes sense for me uh, on a scientific point of view. But also so did eating five meals a day, by the way, and, you know, eating regularly and little meals and all that. That made sense, too. So. Right. Uh, I just think it's one more thing that people beat themselves up over instead of maybe just going back to basics like you talked about, Jenna, and listening to their own bodies instead of something something prescriptive that some strangers told you work for them. Yeah. I, I have a colleague in Australia named Fiona Sutherland, and she posted something brilliant. It was like, if you're listening to me more than you are to yourself, then I'm not doing my job properly. Mm-hmm. 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 And I see that, I see my position very similarly. Like my role is not to tell you, it's to reflect you back to you and to offer mm-hmm. some of the information that I've gathered over the years studying the science and the practice, um, you know, both of nutrition and also the, the meditation and the mindfulness practices. Mm-hmm. Do you talk about actual nutrition? You are a registered dietitian, so you know a lot about nutrition. Do you talk about nutrition at all, or do you not and just go with the intuitive eating and feel that the human body will, in the end, choose healthy foods if allowed to, if if listened to? Well, nutrition is addressed in intuitive eating, but it's interesting to note that it's the 10th of 10 principles, Mm. right? So that tells me that, you know, it's, it's really necessary to deal with your relationship with food and your body before you can bring nutrition back into the game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because if you do it too early, it can again distort the process 
and become sort of dualistic in thinking in terms of good foods and bad foods. Sure, some foods contain more nutrients than other foods. Some foods have been linked to disease prevention or causing disease. Um, but what we don't address often is the effects of that stress. Like you're describing sort of like feeling like you're a bad person because you can't go 12 hours without eating. Like mm -hmm. if you were a client sitting in my, in my office, I would say, congratulations, your body is working. Mm -hmm. You know, my body's working. My head's <laughs> not, though. <laughs> so 12 hours without eating. I mean, I don't go 12 hours. Who goes with 12 hours without eating? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, unless that's your normal thing. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you just happen to finish dinner by eight o'clock and you don't wake up until eight o'clock, God bless you. That hasn't happened to me in a really long time. <laughs> with a <the> toddler. <laughs> um, but, <clears throat> you know, the idea that we feel badly about these things, that creates stress that has an impact on health and disease as well. Um, how are you helping your son uh, develop a healthy relationship with food? Because my mom used to say, eat everything on your plate because they're starving kids in uh, China. Yeah. And so I then, I eat everything on my plate. All, yeah. And I hear now that's, and even she says now she wouldn't, she wouldn't do mm. that. Yeah. Right, right, which is just another example of the cultural context of, of the messages that we absorb and then project on others. So what so, messages are you giving your son? I, I try to um, help him maintain this connection with his intuition. He has really good judgment, and, I, and I've said this since I was pregnant. I've said this since I had this big basketball belly, and I was like, there's a wise individual who will be separate from me in there. And what my job is to help him maintain his sovereignty and to have good judgment mm -hmm. and to know when to listen to his own judgment. So I follow the work of Ellen Satter, um, and she has a, a website, Ellen Satter. Ellen is spelled E-L-L-Y-N. Um, she has this wonderful approach to feeding children called the Division of Responsibility, where the parent's job is to decide what, where, and when. And what is a variety of foods, um, including something that you're pretty sure that the child will accept, um, and also including some new things, knowing that kids need to be exposed to f new foods like 20 times before they might mm. accept it. Um, the where is, you know, at the table. The when is regularly um, spaced meals and snacks. And then the child's job is to, is to decide whether he eats and how much. Mm. And so you keep those two in their own camps and it simplifies things because we don't need to get the same number of calories or the same amount of nutrients every single day. Our bodies can adapt to the changes that naturally happen, right? So over time, over the course of several days or a week or weeks or months, kids naturally self-regulate if given a supportive food environment. And if food is not moralized or used as reward or as punishment. Mm -hmm. I want to do a, a, a pivot um, still under uh, the umbrella of wellness, but to your memoir, Drinking to Distraction. Uh, I think it's, I ordered it on Amazon. Um, and going back to um, my number two step of nothing is ever restricted in, in, mm -hmm. in my life, you know, whatever, I guess, eating and drinking wise. Um, so I've, I've maintained that for, for many, many years, almost 20 years. Um, and, but when I read that you said, um, you know, in, in this memoir, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you know, it's, it, you didn't hit rock bottom, you didn't kill anyone, you didn't have a car accident. I mean, you know, is there some big rock bottom moments for, for alcoholics? Um, and you said, you actually just realized that drinking was not enhancing your life anymore, but it was actually distracting from it. And selfishly speaking, um, my husband and I both enjoy wine. We enjoy wine tasting. We enjoy wine clubs. We enjoy trying to see if oh, this wine is going to go with this food. And, oh, we like this. We don't like that. Um, and it's enjoyable, I think, most of the time. And I think it, I, I've got to read your book to know if we were similar or are similar. It doesn't seem like a problem. I can go three or four nights, no wine, fine. 
And there's aspects of it that I think is enhancing. But then when I, when I read that you said that, I thought, well, there's certainly some elements that are probably distracting as well. And do I, is this really something that I need in my life? Well, there's probably a lot of things in my life that I don't need. <laughs> but, um, so I, I want to just have you talk to our listeners about this memoir, why you wrote it, and um, what's behind you saying that drinking was not really enhancing your life, but maybe distracting from it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a memoir, so it's just my story. Yeah. It's not, it's not advice for other people. It's not a suggestion or an intimation that alcohol is a distraction for everyone. I was not someone, I've never been someone who gave up drinking and then sort of suddenly thinks everyone's an alcoholic. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I, I think that everybody has a different relationship with alcohol or different substances. And I think, sometimes I think if I was exposed to the mindfulness and meditation practices as a child, and I specifically, if I learned how to tolerate discomfort and didn't feel the need to run from it and medicate it and anesthetize it, then I could probably enjoy a glass of wine now and then. Mm. But I didn't. I did not learn that. And so alcohol became one of the ways in which I modified my reality. And then it actually had, you know, some very negative effects for me. You know, I lost time drinking, you know, and in, and in some ways I thought I was living the life, you know, in Boston, everybody seems to be drinking. Um, but I wasn't really present. I wasn't even really there with the people I was supposedly having such a great time with. And in fact, I think I talk about it in that book. My friends threw me a book party for my first book, was a new, which was a nutrition-related book. And the, at the book party, I got so drunk that I wasn't even really there for the people who so generously threw me this party. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, was tragic. You, know? you, you didn't feel you were an alcoholic at all. Uh, you I, just felt you know, like... I don't think that that really even mattered as a question for me, mm. because that became a way that I avoided stopping drinking because I didn't meet my mm. own definition of alcoholism. Right. Oh, I see. That's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I could talk a good game. I mean, usually it was with, you know, a glass in my hand about like how I really need to take a look at my drinking. <laughs> but the truth was I wasn't willing to do the work until I was because I think to, Alcohol, unlike food, does create a chemical addiction. And you do need it more and more and more. And there was a part of me in my early 30s that was thinking, if this goes on for another 10 years, I don't know if it'll feel so optional to stop. Mm -hmm. So that worried me. And it was enough to make me really commit to stopping and to see what happened. And as it turned out, it led me down the path of, of studying Buddhism and practicing meditation and really figuring out what it meant to be present in my life and to tolerate discomfort and to be able to, to be with my experience without needing to change it or run away. And that's mm -hmm. not to say that I don't binge watch Netflix when I'm feeling crappy, but you know, it's more of a decision, a choice, and less of an autopilot or like my only, my only option. You know, you, now that you're meditating and more present in your life, do you ever drink? Or have you chosen to just take it out? I drink kombucha. <laughs> okay. I that's even kombucha. brave. Oh, that's brave. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's so interesting that you chose without your life falling apart you chose to give up alcohol because it wasn't you realized it wasn't making your life better mm -hmm. that you and you then looked into the future and thought how many lost days am I going to have and is it going to get out of control yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that's something for for all of us and the listeners that are kind of like me like huh where I can select 
times and, and areas of my life, like when I'm at home alone with my husband and we're enjoying pairing a wine, it's like, fine. But when I go out, I'm a pretty extreme introvert. Everyone expects that I'm not. They expect that I'm a wild extrovert and I'm aware that society sees me at that. But the truth is I am petrified and pretty much miserable around a lot of people. And I always have a glass of wine. So that is, that's not healthy because I'm not just being there in that space, feeling and experiencing, and maybe just allowing myself to be an introvert in the- to quit drinking in order to experience that discomfort you know yeah oh, yeah, I yeah. That maybe you just experiment with going to one of these events that strikes right. fear in your heart and having a seltzer with wine yeah. you know mm-hmm. um it's it's not going to be fun though i, I mean no because like, i did do that once and party. it wasn't fun at all <laughs> like at all <laughs> so it's doing it yeah. multiple times i think right yeah yeah and, and sitting with myself and I mean, noticing, yeah. Yes, and I, I think of I think of any of these like early days practices as yeah. your most important job is just one of noticing. Notice the jitters, you know. Notice mm-hmm. the desire to bolt. Mm-hmm. Notice the taking account of all the exits. <laughs> you know, um, that's all fine. Could you be with yourself in that discomfort? Yeah, that is that is such a good place to end a question for Dotsie and I and for our listeners and viewers to sit with and say, can can we be in our discomfort? Why do we need to run away? And what does it feel like to be uncomfortable for a little bit? Right. And why are we always seeking comfort? Uh, Yeah. Why can't it be discomfort and that be okay? Yeah. So thank you so much, Jenna, for being on our show. We really appreciate it. It's been a terrific conversation. So good. My yeah. pleasure. I loved it. Good. Glad <laughs> you had fun too, because that, that was extraordinary. And thanks for uh, teaching us all that you did. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.